Assalamu alaikum. I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by His Excellency, the South African Ambassador to the United States in Washington, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasool. Now, Ambassador Rasool was formerly a member of the South African Parliament in the National Assembly. He has been the Special Advisor to the State President of the Republic of South Africa and also the Governor of the Western Cape Province. Abraham Rasool has a long history of involvement in the anti-apartheid struggle, having led the United Democratic Front, the UDF movement, and the African National Congress, the ANC. Your Excellency, Ambassador Abraham Rasool, Salaam Alaikum and welcome to Islam Channel. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullah and it's great to be back on Islam Channel, I've missed it. <laughs> uh, now, the tragic recent death just last month of the iconic and heroic South African leader Nelson Mandela, um, although widely anticipated, uh, took the world uh, as a shock and uh, the world was in mourning. And I imagine it must have had an impact, a very sizable impact on you also, even though you probably anticipated it. Um, can you give us some sort of perspective, what you felt when you heard the news finally and the significance in your opinion of his passing? I think you're right when you say that we were all expecting it. Nelson Mandela, as always, had prepared the world for that moment, and yet the world could not be prepared at all for his passing. I received the call at about 4.30 Eastern Time in Washington um, from Zinzi Mandela, his daughter, to tell me that Nelson Mandela was no more. Despite anticipation and even preparation, for that moment. One could not avoid feeling shocked about it because in a sense, it was as if our hearts had been ripped out. It was the heart that contained the finest values that we stood for, the greatest sacrifices that our country was capable of. It was the one that was our moral compass that kept us pointing through north. And you could not help but be shocked and wondering how will we do without him? Do we need him to be physically present to remind us every day of where we come from, what we stand for, and where we must go to? And I really think that that's the reaction of the world. And so in a real way, um, this is a moment that ordinary South Africans and ev even ordinary citizens of the world are required to imbibe for themselves those values and to live by them. And the doubt that we have is whether we are capable of doing that. Because Nelson Mandela was this comforting figure that everything that he asked us to live for, he himself had done. When he asked us to sacrifice, we knew he had made the greatest sacrifice. Now, going back to the days of apartheid, um, I understand that you, while still in your 20s, you were a prominent anti-apartheid activist, and I gather you met Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela for the first time as a fellow inmate at Polesmore Prison, at the maximum security prison in Cape Town. Um, can you tell us about your, that first encounter and how much of an influence that, had, that meeting had on you? You know, it was my second stint in detention as a political prisoner. And uh, probably one of the harshest states of emergency that we were living through. I had just spent about four or five months in solitary confinement. I was moved to Polesmore Prison. Nelson Mandela had been moved a few years earlier because the apartheid government were afraid of him dying on Robben Island from tuberculosis, amongst others, and had moved him to the hospital in Polesmore Prison. And here I was, a prisoner in the cells that he used to occupy. And one morning, the warden comes up to me, and this warden had been with, Robin Island, um, with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. And this warden comes to me and says, Rasul, get dressed, you're going to hospital. I said, no, I'm fine, I had nothing. He says, no, just get dressed. And we walk through the noisy um, corridors of the, of the prison, and we come to the hospital waiting room. And he says, go in there, and if anyone speaks to you, don't speak loudly. And I open the door, and the only other person in the room is Nelson Mandela. And here was this man who's been in prison for over two decades, 
who had heard about the fact that we were in prison. He knew that I was in prison with very young student leaders, 14, 15, 16 year old, and very old men of the civic associations. And out of that discussion, he gave instruction to the wardens that he gets a film projector on a Friday night and that we should have it on a Saturday night in order to ease the boredom and the anxiety of the young prisoners with us. And that was how for the next few weeks we were watching what Nelson Mandela was watching. And the fascinating thing was that the documentary series that he was watching was all about preparing for his time when he needed to forge a united South Africa. And that's the character of the man. And that was an experience. Those few minutes that I spent with him would forever make me grateful that I was in prison for, that, um, for those few months. Now, during the 80s, you were involved in mobilizing the Muslim community, uh, mostly in the Cape, I understand. You held the leadership role of the United Democratic Front, that's the UDF, and the African National Congress, the ANC, at one point. We do not often hear much about Muslim involvement in the challenging, the brutal system of apartheid, yet I understand that there were many Muslim heroic figures. Um, how significant was Muslim engagement in the uh, anti-apartheid movement? I wouldn't want to overstate our involvement, but you know, one of the first prisoners on Robben Island was a Muslim, and Nelson Mandela acknowledges this in his book, Long Walk to Freedom, when he says he was not the first prisoner on Robben Island and he visited the grave of Sheikh Madura, a political prisoner of Indonesian origin who had fought colonialism in Indonesia and continued his fight in Cape Town, South Africa, and that was 300 years ago. Um, and it's amazing that if anyone saw the film Long Walk to Freedom, they will see that for almost every day of the 27 years that Nelson Mandela was in prison, next to him was someone called Ahmed Katrada. For every year that Oliver Tambo was the exiled president of the African National Congress in Zambia, Lusaka, London, Tanzania, and so forth, we always have Dr. Yusuf Dadu with him in exile. We all know about the brutal murder and the torture of Steve Biko. But as much we had Ahmad Timol thrown out of the 10th floor window of the security branch interrogation room and the brutal killing of Imam Abdullah Harun from Cape Town under torture uh, by the security branch. We all know about Hector Peterson was killed, shot to death on the streets of Soweto, but very few people know about Ibrahim Karelsa and Abdul Karim Freddy, who was shot in the streets of Cape Town, and many others. And so, alhamdulillah, I think that the lessons that Muslims had learned was that the Prophet Muhammad, before he was Rasulullah, the messenger of God, he was Al-Amin, the trustworthy. And through those sacrifices that Muslims had made, and the correct choices they had made to always be on the side of the oppressed, to always stand for justice, to never be seduced by power and by wealth, to join the other side, the side of the oppressors. We had earned the trust of the South African population and had become Al-Amin, the trustworthy. And therefore, when liberation came, it was no surprise that Muslims had pride of place in this new government, in the political negotiations, and in the edifice of democratic South Africa. Now, many believe that the global anti-apartheid movement, and I think you'll probably agree with this, was pivotal in helping to bring an end to the harsh regime. How were the international efforts per received, perceived by those of you on the ground in South Africa during that period? You will never imagine what inspiration it gave us and what hope it gave us to see on television and to see smuggled newspapers and to hear about the fact that for years and years, every day and every night outside the South African Embassy on Trafalgar Square, people were protesting and were keeping protests alive for years on end. You will never imagine how it fired our, our hopes when we saw the Harry Belafontes 
and the Stevie Wonders and the Walter von Troys and all the luminaries of American society being arrested outside our embassy in Washington, D.C., the one that I occupy now. You will never be able to imagine how that gave us a boost and told us that our struggle was the right one, that our sacrifices were not in vain. And especially when you are under siege, when you're under state of emergency, when 20,000 people at a time are in prison, when your leaders are in prison for almost three decades, and you begin to see what happens in the capital of the UK, in the capital of the United States, in capitals all over the world, you then know not only is history on your side, but God is also on your side. Now, it's a fact, a point of fact, that our own British government were amongst just three countries that vetoed Mandela's earlier release and ensured that, in fact, he spent another 13 years incarcerated uh, in the prison. Uh, do you hold any animosity towards Britain for its role in perpetuating, in a sense, the apartheid regime? No, I think that animosity doesn't come into that matter. I think that it's unfortunately the nature of Western governments that they act according to their interests and not in accordance to their values. They view the world through the prism of their interests and not through the prism of what they purport to stand for. And so I think one must actually accept a degree of hypocrisy as being fairly germane to that great level of power politics. I think that it will forever be a blot on any claims made by Washington, London and other countries who stood against Nelson Mandela and called him a terrorist and supported his incarceration. And that is why they all tried to gather at his funeral, not only to pay tribute to a man, but also to seek absolution. They will forever carry that. If anything, if we have doubts about what they did in Iraq, if we have doubts about what their role is with regard to Palestine, if we have doubts about what they're doing elsewhere in the world, then that moment we doubt about how they prioritize their interests over their values. Now, what was, in your opinion, the turning point that led to eventually the release of Mandela in February 1990 after 27 years of incarceration? I think it's a combination of factors. I think it is when Republicans and Democrats in the United States got together in 1986 to overturn Ronald Reagan's veto when his own base rebelled against him and forced him to accept the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act. And even though sanctions were not able to bite, the white business and white intellectuals in South Africa saw the beginning of the end because they prided themselves that their mission was a civilizing one. And you can't be a civilizing mission if you are cut off from the bastions of civilization. So that was one. The second one, would clearly be the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because, in a sense, up till that moment, the apartheid regime could elicit sympathy from London and from Washington based on the fact that they were the bastion of anti-communism. When the Berlin Wall fell, their fig leaf dropped. And the third one was that the internal resistance, despite harsh levels of repression and successive states of emergency, could now for the first time begin to breach the apartheid edifice, make the country ungovernable, give the prospect of the white to the white community for a battle and conflict forever and ever. That we had a generation of young people who knew no fear, who our parents grew up after Mandela was jailed in 1960s, the ANC was banned, Tambo was exiled and so forth, and they grew up with that fear. The generation of 1976 did not know that fear and were fearless. And they were the generations and every subsequent one after that, that took the fight to the apartheid government without reservation. They did not mind dying. And that, when the apartheid government looked in their eyes, they knew that these were not people who could be intimidated into silence. Now, when the ANC finally took power, it faced huge challenges. 
and enormous expectation levels. Uh, many have asked whether the path adopted in those early years of peace and reconciliation was a mistake. Uh, do you think there was another way or was there any alternative? You know, sometimes it takes an event 20 years later to affirm that what Nelson Mandela did in 1994 was correct. Because you can act as if you have won. You can have the triumphalism of a victor. But the Egyptian example shows us how short lived it can be. That sometimes the real victory is when you are able to dampen the fears of what we inherited an essentially white army, an essentially white bureaucracy, an essentially white police force. They had to be seduced into understanding that they had nothing to fear. And that's why there was no prospect of counter-revolution or a coup d'etat. Because Nelson Mandela did not see it as demeaning to reconcile with him, did not see it as humiliating to engage them and to offer them coalition partnerships in the government, did not see it as a defeat to offer them certain guarantees for at least the next five years. Because he understood that we have absorbed so much humiliation in South Africa that five more years of compromise would be worthwhile a lifetime of democracy, of peace, of human rights, and of freedom and dignity. Those who often appear very brave and very triumphalist, they appeal to our blood. But they, they, their experiments are often short-lived. This year we are celebrating 20 years of a free South Africa. It is one of the most unfortunate situations that Egypt couldn't celebrate one year of a free and democratic Egypt. Now, Nelson Mandela is held up as an icon for non-violent resistance, although there were many times during the early years when uh, he at least recognised the need for armed struggle. Uh, I think his famous speech, uh, which uh, I think he spoke at, for an hour and a half at the Pretoria Supreme Court back in 60, I think it was 67, um, ended with the famous lines, and I'll, and I'll quote him, during my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it's an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. Now, would you say that one, the non-violent approach was one that we have continued to live up to? And do you think his ideals, the ideals that were encompassed in that conclusion, are true of the ANC today and of South Africa today? I think in that quote is probably the seminal lesson on leadership. It's a description of leadership that says that I have not only fought against domination against me, but domination from me. It's a double-edged sword that cuts equally both ways. The second thing, it's a speech that prioritizes and sequences how you, how you see your struggle unfolding. In the first instance, your ideals are those that you wish to live for and to achieve. Secondly, if needs be, it's what you are prepared to die for. You don't primarily want to die for your beliefs. There are too many people who want to die for their beliefs because they often don't know how to live their beliefs. And so they want to die in a flame of bravado rather than in a life of exertion. How do I make these ideals work? So I think that that's a seminal lesson from the life of Nelson Mandela. It's very difficult to live up to it. But I think that Nelson Mandela had the wisdom and he once said, and I'll paraphrase him, he once said that the key to the protection of rights is to put them out of the reach of temporary majorities. 
meaning that every government that comes in is for that period a temporary majority. Tomorrow a new majority can come. Today's majority may love Muslims and give them all the rights. Tomorrow's majority may hate Muslims and try to take it away. Today's majority may hate gays and take away their rights. Tomorrow's majority may embrace gays and give them their rights. But you can't live a society that is based on the mood and the personality of the temporary majority that is in power. So what the constitution does is to ensure that the highest ideals of a country and of a nation are put out of reach of temporary majorities. So that if I come in tomorrow and I don't like Hindus, that I don't start changing the constitution to make life hell for Hindus. And so that, I think, is the approach. I have very little concerns that in South Africa you may have politicians who say one thing and another thing, but the test of our durability is whether our constitution has enough firewalls against temporary majorities. Now, finally, uh, it has been suggested by some that those who benefited from the supremacist regime still retain huge influence and that the divide between the haves and the have-nots still exists in South Africa, albeit with a few more black faces now in a position of wealth and power. The South African miners' strike and the killing of 34 by police in 2013 seem to open the lid on the ongoing exploitation of ordinary workers. How serious are the disparities and do you believe that the dreams and aspirations of the ANC are way off and yet to be achieved? Are you confident in conclusion about the future of South Africa with its iconic leader no longer with us? I think I have sufficient confidence to know that the current leadership understands that they need to make the second transition. Nelson Mandela had been the most able leader for the first transition from apartheid to democracy and to enshrine socio-political rights in our society. Within that, he understood that we did not have command of things like the economy, but we had command of the state and therefore utilized the state to make sure that every citizen has access to water, electricity, education, health, etc., pensions and grants and everything like that. So South Africans by and large have had an enormous patience for the first 20 years because they know that today is better than yesterday and they live in the hope that tomorrow will be better than today. But tomorrow will be better than today if we drive the second transition. If the first one was about socio-political rights, the second one has to be about socio-economic rights. And I think that that's on the agenda. I think secondly, if the first one, the first transition, was a transition about achieving quantitative goals. So many houses, so many electricity, so many water link ups, so many in school, so many hospitals, etc. The second transition is about qualitative gains. What happens in the schools? Does the health system care for you? Is the economy going to create jobs? And so I think that those are the challenges that we face. And so it's not about creating contrasts between leaders, but in looking for the continuity between leaders. Nelson Mandela understood that he was just one runner in the huge relay race of history of South Africa. He's handed the batons over. He was great at reconciliation. Others will be better at reconstruction. And he's handed that baton over after just five years. And that's the greatness of the man. And that's the challenge to us. And I think that there are sufficient people who understand that challenge who are up to it in a very difficult globe, a very difficult recession that the world is in. But I think that just the awareness of what we must do is going to be enough to carry us forward. Your Excellency, Abraham Rasul, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us again on Islam Channel. No, thank you very much and it's great to be here again and good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.